Yeah, we're live now. Should we should we start with uh, just going round the room with introductions? Yes, yes. Let's, let's get started. Okay, okay we are live. manage their supply chain risk so supply chain is super complicated we make it super easy for companies to to manage their blind spot the risk uh, within within their supply chain before that i started an edtech company which was acquired by google in pen My most excellent background to supply chain. For 15 years, I was the head of DM purchasing and DM supply chain. We produced 10 million vehicles in 165 plants in 100 countries, and I was responsible for supply chain and purchasing. And we normally had one big problem every day, but we never had two. Awesome. Uh, Lugi, you want to go next? Yeah, for sure. Good morning, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. My name is Luigi Cavallito. I'm uh, I'm originally from Torino, but uh, I live in Lebanon, and uh, I manage there an incubation program for social enterprises uh, uh, that are trying to enhance social justice in the Middle East and the Mediterranean area. Previously to this experience, uh, I have uh, collaborated with several different organizations and, and also governmental uh, and international body. Uh, right now, I'm also responsible uh, uh, for the Youth20, that is uh, the G20 platform uh, for uh, young people uh, in Italy that is going to host uh, the event in 2021. I'm part of the Global Shapers community of the World Economic <laughs> Forum, and I'm um, a business angel in several different companies. Uh, good morning, John. Welcome to, Hello, John. to John. the session. And Jacques, you can go ahead. Welcome, We're John. just doing around the presentation. John. Hi. You are welcome. Finally, you uh, you taught us how to make it smooth, and finally, the, the, the <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been trying for 15 minutes since since uh, you know since 20 minutes to get this to work. It we were all on time, ahead of time, as you ask us. Yeah, you all did the right thing. It's, my system crashed just a few minutes before, and then it wouldn't let me in. But anyway, let's get started. You guys are already started introducing self-introductions. Yeah, Jack. Yes. About, we are. Uh, my name is Jack Terrell. I'm the chairman of the World Trade Center organization in Poland here, which is a part of the Global World Trade Center Association with uh, affiliated World Trade Centers in more than 300 of the biggest cities, business cities in the world, close to 100 countries, with a very big networking of uh, trade and business. And I'm um, glad to be here. We involve in, uh, in, uh, in international trade and business promotion in uh, investment in support uh, to the local uh, businesses in Poland and to foreign businesses to do business in our region, in our country. That's what we do on a daily basis. Who's awesome. still so John, John we, we did the round of introductions, so we are done with that. So it's, uh, 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 it's all yours now. Okay, perfect. So, so I'm John Cook. Uh, for those who are dialing into our session here, I'm chairman of Rock Lake uh, Advisors based in Zurich, and uh, we do private equity capital raising and, and strategic advisory work in private equity infrastructure, real estate, and so forth. And I've been uh, attending the, the uh, Horasis events now for about 10 years. Horasis, which is a really top, top uh, global think tank. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for joining us on our panel today. I've got a couple of opening remarks since we've done the, the introductions. Thank you very much. Um, I would just want to set the stage by a couple of pre prepared remarks that I've, that I've put together. Globalization has been around for a long, long time. It started off in uh, the Roman Empire, uh, Marco Polo, Christopher Columbus, uh, the British Empire, and now the modern era. Uh, there's no turning back. 
Um, nowadays, uh, many of the fastest growing economies in the world are the de- in, the, in the developing world. Um, and those markets account for almost 60% of GDP, global GDP. They're home to 85% of the world's population and about 5 billion out of 7 billion people uh, will be the middle class uh, purchasing with purchasing power in by 2030. About 95% of consumers live outside the U.S. It's a huge um, consumer market opportunity for the U.S. Since this session is about U.S. leadership in globalization and supply chain. Um, exports in the U.S. economy count for about, counted for about 5% of the U.S. economy in 1965 and 12% in uh, 2015. Uh, emerging markets account for more than half of all U.S. exports. And even the poorest two-thirds of the world's population represent about $5 trillion in purchasing power per year. The world, uh, world prosperity, in short, depends on a strong American economy and American leadership. The U.S. accounts for about 25% of the world's economy and is home to nine out of the 10 world's largest brands. America is the largest and most dynamic market globally, able to influence economic activity in every country in the world. However, America's prosperity rests on its engagement in the global economy, and the rest of the world is rapidly catching up, as it should. Global prosperity and values-based freedom depend on American leadership. We need stability in emerging markets from all points of view. For these reasons, it's important that globalization is led by the U.S., which is which it has been doing since since before World War II, since the, the since the, the the last century. So it's in everybody's interest to make sure that we do have a, a American leadership, uh, as well as other world other other countries in the world leading the charge. Um, I think I'd like to ask uh, Jacques if you would uh, take the next. Uh, a uh, few minutes to share with us your view on the, since you're with a world trade organization in Poland and part of a global world trade or, trade organization platform, your views on where globalization is now, let's say past, present and future and what the challenges are in your view. And then we'll move on. Thank you, John. You, uh, you uh, were painting a very beautiful picture of the United States. I don't know if the, if the reality is, is so much as you uh, as you described it, because if we're looking in the globalization index, which is published every year, United States is uh, taking this year only the 25th position. And uh, if we ask ourselves, uh, what is globalization? If you try to define globalization, of course, uh, you have the issue of the of the influence on the world economy, but uh, is it a part of uh, the globalization of United States? With the, what their contribution is, uh, no doubt, enormous. Uh, not to mention only the all the global platforms that we are all using yeah, for, to communicate with each other. They're all American companies. They dominate uh, the world communication in our communication era, but the, even what we see now with the pandemic that we're all uh, facing this crisis, the, the vaccines, the innovation, it came from the United States. They dominate the, the, this uh, scientific, uh, speedy scientific solution to the, to the pandemic, those American companies. So uh, definitely the contribution of United States economy and companies is is leading the world. But the difference between this and being a globalized country is very big. When we say globalized country, what what you mean by globalization? You have the few points which is which makes a country globalized. First of all is how many uh, trade agreements they have with other countries. Then what kind of tariffs they have what kind of uh, regulations and laws to protect investment, to protect trade, protect import-export, 
do they have? What kind of safety and security measurements do they have for international trade and for protection of, uh, of goods and, and financing? So United States is still not leading in this in these categories according to the, uh, the global index that is published by the organization that you mentioned. So the question is just now that we see with the with the uh, actually what is the nothing is more global now than the the pandemic that we're all facing. I mean, it was never in history uh, any any common issue that globalized and define the word globalization than the pandemic. And this actually changed and transformed what we knew as globalization up to this time, which is, it was a beautiful story. The world is open, goods are moving from place to place, the politics are liberalized. It was beautiful, a beautiful world. And uh, now we, we see that it doesn't work because countries uh, are left alone to deal with the pandemic, they are left alone to deal with the wounds, to take care of the death of the sick, of their oldest problem, the, the economies are collapsing. As we say, by the way, that it's not COVID that collapsed the economies, it's go governments collapsed the economies. But, the, but uh, the, uh, it, this all raised trends of nationalism, patriotism. Countries ask themselves, do we need really to be a part of this game? or we take care of ourselves because we open our markets, we open our goods, and what do we get from this in return? When something, when a trouble come, no friends. We are left alone, not, nobody is coming, we have to bury our death. And, and uh, we see this trend of patriotism and uh, nationalism policies all over the world that actually is threatening what was built, uh, started to build as globalization and free world, movement of goods, of people, of financing. Everything is now in question. And uh, Could we just uh, pause there for a second then, Jacques? Um, thanks, thanks very much. You, you raised some very good points there. I mean, the question about uh, where are we with, with globalization? And the U.S. is not uh, leading globalization as it did at one point. And the question is who, who is leading the world? Who does rank at the top of globalization? Maybe we could move on. Luigi, I know you've got a, a tremendous global experience coming from Italy, living in Lebanon, working across countries. What's your view on what uh, Jacques has just shared and what's your view on globalization and who's leading it? First of all, uh, thank you, John, for framing it and thank you, Jacques, to give us uh, some numbers and some issues. Uh, I want also to, to quote uh, uh, two late person that, uh, in my perspective, uh, they frame globalization properly. One is uh, the late director of UN, Kofi Annan, uh, that uh, says, uh, it has been said that arguing against globalization uh, is like arguing against the laws of gravity. And as you mentioned before, we think that globalization is uh, like a modern phenomena. No, but it's, it's from uh, the very past and being from Italy, like uh, it's quite representative of uh, how history was uh, going before we started also to frame the world as it is. That is more or less, uh, it has been framed, if you think about all the institutions that we have uh, after the Second World War, like the IMF, the World Bank, every border. And uh, if you think about the Middle East and so on, they really put lines uh, based on the influence of countries not based on the histories of people. Right now, for example, we have a, a huge issue at the border between uh, Syria, Iran, uh, and Turkey. That is an area that someone called Kurdistan, but it's not existing. Or uh, let me say in Africa or other parts of the world. But uh, it's also true, and I want to quote someone that is uh, formerly from uh, the country where Bo comes from, that is uh, a scientist called Hans Rosling, uh, that he published a very interesting book called Factfulness, uh, because he started to understand uh, that either in kindergarten, but also in the international conference like the World Economic Forum, uh, the people doesn't really know how the world is looking like, uh, and that actually in the last years, uh, human history is... Uh, has created a world that is better than before. And just to, to give you some examples, uh, in the modern era, globalization uh, has made uh, life expectancy, ex expectancy growing continue to rise. Child mortality is continue to fall. Fertility rates uh, are falling. GDP growth has accelerated in developed countries and not developers considering by global uh, uh, charts. Global income inequality has gone down. 
because most of the time uh, we say that globalization uh, is uh, driving inequality. It's true, it depends from which perspective, and it's also true that right now maybe the conversation is not in between uh, growth uh, and degrowth, uh, equality or inequality, but it's like how to make it sustainable. So we have uh, a globalization 2.0 or 3.0, it's considered where we start from. And th when I told you something, for example, the UNDP and the Global Compact frame uh, that the opportunity for sustainable development uh, it's going to be potentially for private sector an opportunity of 12 trillion US dollars. So in this scenario where all the companies are uh, in a way asked to try to update their business model to a world where globalization can really make all the people uh, moving forward in a way or another, the real question is, is it something that one country, even the biggest one like US can do? Or is it something that we have to do together? And if you think about Africa right now, there is a huge opportunity and a common agenda that has never been done in history, Agenda 2063. Imagine when we talk about Oasis, uh, we talk about vision. They frame an agenda for something that is going to happen in between now and 43 years from now. That it's quite amazing because uh, in the past, uh, no one in Africa talk to each other if you were coming from a different country. And uh, China is the second largest economy. And sometimes it depends which data you collect. It's challenging America. So we are going and we are moving faster into an era of transformative growth where countries need to take care of each other. And as you frame properly, it's on everybody's interest that America come back to the arena and do its part because it won't work globalization without America. And it won't work if America is not ready to talk with other countries and other regions. This is like mainly the contribution that I would love to frame right now to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the underlying, for me, underlying message is, is uh, globalization is here. There's no going back. Uh, it started way, way back when. It's accelerating. Technology, mobile phones, uh, digital travel is all accelerating it. And the question is, how do we make the most of it? We, we do have to encourage it. And whoever is the leader of it, it has to, it has to have leadership. And so let me turn to uh, Bo, if you could. You are a man of tremendous accomplishment in the area of supply chain with your background. And you've introduced yourself. So you are in a position to be able to have a unique perspective, I think, on, on the stitching together globalization issues through your supply chain experience. Can you share with us your challenges on the supply chain side uh, and Yasaki, what you've learned and what your perspectives are and what your suggestions and recommendations would be to try to improve globalization from your perspective? Thank, thank you, John. So first, I, I spend most of my time in automotive and for many of you, automotive is not that sexy, but it, it's still a $10 trillion business. Secondly, when you think about the U.S., in 1955, General Motors was the most profitable company in the U.S., and it was the first company to make a billion dollar in profit. A billion dollar in profit in 1955 was the same as 40,000 American companies together. Secondly, we saw in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s that the Japanese and Koreans started to become very dominant. And third, today, China is the largest market. Fourth, we see that for automotive makers, it's better to produce where you sell, so you have a natural balance. However, to the supply chain issue, it's millions of parts being on the way any given day. We are a very large automotive supplier, and to put it in perspective, Yasaki parts, are in one of every three cars produced with combustion engines, one of every second car with hybrid, and one of every second car with fully electric vehicle. What we have learned is we didn't have a good traceability of our supply chain. We had good traceability of our tier ones, but not the tier twos, not the tier threes. Sometimes the tier twos and tier threes they were not producers, they were distributors. So the message is we need to have much better visibility. The good thing with COVID, it has shown us where the weaknesses are. 
and it has also shown that we need to have much, much better transparency. The last couple of weeks, I have invited our customers, the big OEMs, like Toyota, Honda, GM, Stellantis, Ford, to participate together with our suppliers to help us prioritize. Because in the last month, it has become an issue of allocation. And lately, we have semiconductors. The industry is totally surprised that the semiconductor industry that is not very large for automotive. They did not believe that automotive would come back. So they were starting to sell to computer makers or game makers that meant that that capacity is now gone. These big wafer plants that are doing semiconductors, they often have a lead time of 6, 12 months. So yesterday I was surprised that Toyota, one of the best, one of the best managed companies, they told us that they will take their plants down in Europe for a couple of weeks, suddenly. Mm -hmm. So that brings down the whole, the whole supply chain, brings down yeah. many, many countries. Yes, and thousands of people will be unemployed and be home on unemployment benefits. Interesting. So let me thank you, thank you for that start. Let me uh, move on now and ask Jitesh, Jitesh, your your uh, technology, Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, uh, Indian talent uh, origin. Uh, you are launching a new company, Infinite Chains, to support the traceability of products. And so your whole head from morning till night is buried in supply <clears> chain and how that stitches the economy together. What do you? What could you say about supply chains and what you're doing for it? Yeah, yeah. So just stepping back, right? Uh, I mean, uh, just to touch a little bit on globalization, I feel there are two aspects at a very macro level. One is uh, the soft uh, aspect, which is not tangible, which is cultural. And I think that piece is really getting very normalized and internationalized, right? And what I mean by that is that if you're growing up anywhere in the world today, it is very easy for you to have a common ground, have a conversation and have a transaction with anyone anywhere else in the world, right? That soft, uh, uh, not tangible aspect is, is getting globalized. There is, there is no way for governments to regulate that. And technology is playing a big role there, right? And where uh, anyone anywhere in the world can very quickly figure out what's happening in, in another country. And and there's a there's a kind of a common theme uh, that we all have now. That's that's one piece. Now the second piece is where you have the more kind of tangible aspect, where uh, you know uh, where it comes down to goods and services. So in that case, I do feel uh, regulation uh, plays a very very big role, and we are definitely seeing. Uh, governments both in the Western world, but also in Asia become more kind of localized, right? They're saying that produce more local. That's one. The second change that's happening there is that the way we thought about the world in the 90s, where the US is a big consumer and stuff is going to get produced in Asia, that's changing. That's changing in a very big way. I see that in my own company. Uh, which is today very focused on uh, the garment and the textile industry. But we allow uh, companies uh, to better manage their supply chain risk. What we are seeing is a shift in the consumer pattern, yeah. right? We are seeing that uh, it's no more that skewed a world where the consumers are in the U.S. and stuff is getting manufactured in Asia. Uh, now uh, the consumers are all over the place. You do see premium consumers in Asia. But the first piece is where I still feel the U.S. is playing a very big role in having this kind of uh, cultural normalization that is being driven by uh, U.S. technology companies. So I'll give you a very tangible kind of example, right? My daughter, so I grew up in India, in a very small town in India, moved here in 2002. My daughter was born in California. So when I think about her, if she grows up in Palo Alto when she's like 18, 19, and she thinks that I want to build something small and create value, it is going to be very easy for her to collaborate with like someone in France uh, to design her stuff 
somebody in india to do the software engineering somebody in china to do the manufacturing there is a common ground it was not possible when i was growing up right to just have that common ground so that is globalization that kind of have uh, having a common ground to have that conversation there is no way to regulate that governments cannot push that back i cannot see any regulation closing my daughter and putting her in a silo right and saying that you cannot have a conversation with a set of people now it can regulation can make the second piece difficult right uh, where you know uh, if she's saying that i'm going to build this in china there will be a, a larger tariff on that so i think we are seeing a world where uh, it will be easier and easier for us to have a common ground as humans and have communications that is largely being driven by technology companies which are largely american today and i see more and more american companies uh, in a better role uh, to uh, to push that technology and make it more global right and the second piece we have to really see how it plays out right what happens there and i think there is a shift that's going to happen uh more than what people realize where uh asia is going to be a huge consumer it's going to be a very very big consumer and uh, and supply chains are getting like uh, supply chain is in the middle of all of this right we are trying to figure out okay how do you kind of uh, uh really kind of rejigger all of this and it's it's fascinating it's a fascinating world not many people realize this i came from a very core tech world i my last company was in the education tech space uh and when i came into the supply chain world as as bo said it's non sexy uh but uh it touches all of us wherever you are what you're consuming it's coming from a global supply chain even if you're watching something on netflix you're watching something on youtube it is being uh, uh, uh created somewhere else the production is done somewhere else uh so it's a fascinating world and that's going to really get impacted uh in a very big way thank you john interesting interesting perspectives um so lots of issues brought up here bo you mentioned transparency more transparency is needed and um in from your perspective and and uh, jitesh has talked about uh the increasing influence of the soft side the the technology um where do you think uh the te- the tra- the tra- the uh, transparency is needed is it at a policy level is it at a product level is it at a transportation level and how how would you and how would you and jitesh come to terms on where technology ought to play a role in that transparency i mean first for john when everything is working you don't know what is working so that's my first point the, the second one is we all have some type of experience with amazon.com they have done a very very good job to track and follow where the goods are if i take established industries i've been part of we have not been that good because it always worked and if you take a container ship today is maybe 22000 containers we as a relatively large oem or supplier if we have 16000 containers in a year that means that on a container ship we have six containers it's not that easy to get them we don't have a priority and we I'm telling my people that I'm somewhat a control freak and if you don't have a mobile number to the captain of that ship and if you didn't call them and said did you leave Yokohama in time and will you be able to get into Manila if you don't have a shame on you they look at me like you're crazy uh, Jacques Jacques I want to I want to come back to you Jacques you opened the session with some com- comments about you know challenging the american leadership uh in the in the globalization space and frank uh richter has asked us he's posed a question to us you know the, why america must be the champion of globalization so when you look at the world you're in the world trade center you see a lot of stuff going back and forth in your internal reports who do you see in the ranking who do you see giving the best example of as a country of globalization who's taking the best decisions 
it's a very difficult question because there's not a, there's a many good decisions and bad decisions. And uh, we have to separate between what you define and describe as leaders in technologies and in innovations in, in financing, in, in purchasing power in the, in the number one economy in money, where the money is, to globalization. There are two different things. The power of America is actually leading the, the dominating the globalization by its technology, innovation, and financial. Even everything is still, still related to US dollars, all the big transactions, although this is also beginning to be challenged very strongly by uh, other countries. For example, in Poland now, we can make with China every transaction in uh, Yuan, in RMB. The Chinese companies can buy, can purchase goods in Poland in RMB and pay for Polish companies in RMB. So we eliminate all this exchange rate and it's already accepted here and it works very well with all the exports of Poland to China and uh, purchasing goods from China. Uh, innovative new uh, new uh, ideas that makes our life much more easy. But I I think that John, we see the whole uh, globalization issue challenged by many countries, and many countries love it. You have a lot, you mentioned a lot of pluses advantages. Why is good for all of us? But on the other hand, not everybody see it as good. You see with the policy of Donald Trump that used to be uh, America is first and uh, many countries start to be the same. They think my country should be first. They want to be a part of the global community. On the other hand, to keep their internal affair for themselves, they say everything, if you criticize them, they say, oh, it's internal. And they don't want to be a part of it. They're closing the door. On the other hand, the global issues are really not related to trade, not related to, to goods. The global issues we are all facing, which unite all of us, are issues like climate change, like ecology, like uh, global warming, like the uh, security that we're facing, the pandemics that are coming to us and are going to come. So uh, the, we see that the national governments with the national policies, they cannot affect global issues. We are all seeing on the sitting on your uh, cyber ocean part of it. We are all connected, and they want to be separate. So they, we see uh, trends in in different countries that they really would love to protect their industries. To pro and they're putting now more and more uh, tax barriers and uh, giving this subsidies and financial support to local companies to be let able to compete. Let me let me just jump in and interrupt you for a second, Jacques. Um, we've got about three minutes left to think about, uh, or, or five minutes left, and we should probably move, move on to uh, wrapping up our session. It, it goes very quickly, 45 minutes. And I think it'd be helpful to go around to each of us and give a sort of a uh, perspective, one minute uh, final comment, having had this discussion. Luigi, uh, could you answer the question that Frank has posed why America should be leading the, the globalization challenge? I will try. Uh, In one minute. I, I will try. It's a tough question. Uh, and uh, I do believe that it's like, uh, instead of why America has to lead, it's uh, <clears throat> what is going to happen if America is not going to be part of the leadership. As we have seen, uh, especially to the sustainable uh, growth that we all need, uh, uh, the point where America left the Paris Agreement, uh, it was quite a shock. And the point where the Paris Agreement was uh, in the first day in the office of Joe Biden uh, and all the world, uh, I think that the comment was, uh, we are back at the table. It's like, uh, it was uh, what uh, all the other countries were waiting. America back to the table. So for me, the question is the answer. 
that uh, if you try to do it again without America, like uh, sustainability is not going to succeed, uh, migration policies are not going to succeed, either the other countries are not going to succeed. So it's better to have America on board than, than not. That's exactly what my, my answer would be. Jitesh, what would be, what would be your answer to the yeah, question? Yeah, very similar, right? It's in the U.S.'s fabric uh, to be global. Like we are like a global country. Uh, it is uh, the history of the country is like that. So it's counterintuitive to suddenly say that we are going to not uh, have a global mindset. It is just counterintuitive. It is not the DNA of the country itself. That's one. Second, uh, I think two things will happen. One is going back to my uh, lens of how I view the world, right? One is that are we as humans becoming more uh, kind of, uh, uh, there, is there a common ground? I think that is going to accelerate with technology. There is no way to stop it, right? That is going to continue to happen. You cannot put any human in any country in a silo, in a box and say that, you belong to this country, you're a patriot, you won't uh, have a common ground with anyone else. That will continue to happen. I think the second piece is we have to figure out how do we have sustainable growth wherever you are. You are a blue collar worker in India, in the US, you're a blue collar worker in Midwest, in the US. How do you have sustainable growth, right? Not just corporations make money, but how do we kind of have, uh, how do we uh, sustain this? And I do believe in the, in the uh, deep of my heart that the U.S. is better positioned to do that. You know, the U.S. is better positioned. When I think about companies anywhere in the world, they are more okay listing in the U.S. And there's a reason why, right? Uh, it's still an international country. It's a global country. It's a fair country. Bo, what would be your perspective on uh, answering Frank's question, why the U.S. should be playing a leading role continuing in globalization? I would take a little bit different perspective, and I think it's important to think about generations. If you think about our parents and you think about our children and ask four questions, what type of newspapers did your parents read and what do you read? What newspapers will your children read? The, the same for TV, the same for food, and the same for vacation. And I think we will see a continuous evolution in where people get their news where people get their entertainment, what people eat, and where they travel. Because it's, finally it's the only democracy when there's, everything is still transparent and we know what's going on. And, uh, and uh, nobody, no government is dominating and is still keeping the free world, the free world. But I think that more and more uh, voices are raised now uh, to criticize the United Nations for not taking the lead role and being so silenced during this pandemic crisis because we see that the world is transformed to totally a new world. And we like to see that uh, in the General Assembly, the leaders are trying to find the new system for the new world, because all oh, the, the nationalism is becoming big. So in the national the economies again, or you globalize policies and, and monetary systems, because the differences are very big. The, the cyber is connecting uh, 